Pal Capel, welcome back to the show. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Where are you right now? Are you in Chamonix? No, not yet. I'm now I'm in, in Calafeis, in the more or less the south of Catalonia with my family. I I have been here two days and now I come back to Andorra and after Andorra I go to Chamonix for the UTMB. Yeah. So is uh, training starting to wrap up for UTMB now? I imagine we're now two weeks ahead of the start of the race. I'm imagining that you're probably feeling pretty tired coming close to the end of your training block. Yeah. 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 Now at the typical lady that you are going to train here is really hot. The feeling is the nervous, all of this, and it's complicated to manage these days. Eh? Yeah. I, I feel more nervous than, than other things. So yeah, it's more really take it easy, take it easy, do some trainings, don't think a lot about the race, listen some podcast uh, to disturb your mind, and yeah. enough. So you're feeling nervous though. Let, let's talk about that yeah. because you don't strike me as the type of athlete that gets nervous. You know, you kind of have this confident swagger to you, you know, and you always have like this great kind of personality of, you know, chasing your dreams and setting big goals. I it, tell me a little bit about the, the nervous energy. So w when you have a big dream, then you can fail. And that's why the nervous appears. So yeah. Uh, normally for the races, it's depending on the race, but for the Mont Blanc especially, I feel nervous before the race. Uh, I don't want to show, to show the nervous because it's an advantage for the other people. Yeah. So I prefer to stay calm when I'm outside home and then at home, maybe talk more about this nervous with my family, with my girlfriend yeah. and then yeah, try to, yeah, try to be with calm at home because if not the nervous will will kill me yeah well it's understandable i mean obviously utmb is the biggest stage on earth and you're one of very few people who has had the true honor of knowing what it feels like to win the race and i'm sure you're gonna, yeah. you have big goals for yourself going into this year's race in 2022 especially coming off injury and i want to talk about all that stuff, but let's maybe just catch up from the last time we talked. You were actually one of the early guests on the podcast we recorded mm -hmm. after you won Trans Grand Canaria for the fourth consecutive time back mm -hmm. in 2020. And that was just before the pandemic happened, February of 2020. And you were only six months removed from your victory at UTMB. Um, and I know the last couple of years have been probably one of the most challenging moments in your career. And you went from like this immense high to sort of getting knocked back down to earth with injury. So maybe just tell us a little bit about what that injury was and, and the operation that you had done on your knee. Mm. So yeah, it has been a problem for me because I was, I was feeling so good after UTMB and after Trans and Canaria 2020. And I think that I was in, my best performance and and the pandemic appears and I was at home training like everybody and it was like in a race that you are feeling so good and then the stomach explodes and you have to stop and it was this kind of feeling you know, that I want to continue running but the races are off it's impossible to run outside and and I was uh, some not nervous but uh, I was thinking in the future and I didn't know what I could manage the situation because I wanted to run and it was impossible. And that's why I created the Breaking 20. I did some projects. And after these projects appears the injuries. And I think it's because I was training a lot in the, in the treadmill. I didn't train in the mountain too much. Yeah. And then when I wanted to run 100 miles, 180 kilometers in Menorca yeah. and one other project, the the body wasn't ready. Yeah. And, and appears these injuries. And last year, 2021, it was pff, a complicated year for me. It yeah. was the worst, the worst year for me because I suffer here in my face uh, and stress and appears, I don't know in English, but uh, some uh, problem here. Uh, uh -huh. And it's, it's the fact uh, when you are really stressed, when you have a lot uh, of pressure, when you want to do a lot of things, mm. appears this problem. 
So it was then, like like almost a, a pain in your head, like a, a yeah. headache type yeah. thing? I don't know if you can see or not. Sorry, that uh, is here. Yeah, I have okay. One, one signal here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it was, I had to stop because wow. the body said, Pau, if you don't stop, this will be worst, will be yeah. other problems. And this happened after uh, my travel to Kenya. I went to Kenya in in January 21. Mm -hmm. I went there to to be faster, to learn with the Kenyan athletes. I went there two weeks. And when I came back home, my body said, Pau, you did too much in yeah. Kenya. And, and after that appears the, the injuries. Yeah. Stress fracture in, in the coccyx. And then uh, the big injury in my knee. And all the year was like uh, up, down, up, down, and it was complicated. It was, yeah. uh, for my mental health, it was too complicated. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because obviously every athlete, especially every high-level athlete, at some point hits a year that's just very hard where mm -hmm. one thing after the next seems to fail and you can't seem to build any momentum. And just when you feel like, you are another injury pops up. And like I said, this happened to you at the moment that you were at the highest height of your career and in the sport, right? You sort of over the course of a few years, built your reputation, built your skill and mm -hmm. sort of got to the highest level, you know, like Pau Capel winning UTMB again, very few people have mm -hmm. that luxury in their lives. What was it like going from that high to that, that deep low on sort of like an emotional psychological level? So uh, I have to, to explain a little bit more because after UTMB, my last relation stopped and it was a plus, no? So uh, I was alone. I was with the pandemic. I was with injuries and all the things were so bad. And, and my life changed a little bit. I was re really happy with the sponsors, for example. So all of them uh, were with me in in this way and I was mm -hmm. with a good support so I was really happy for that but then my personal life changed a little bit and and it's really hard it's really hard to manage because you know what you have to do you know what is the plan uh, you know what you did for win the UTMB but then you are I'm human I'm not a robot I have feelings I I love and and then when you can't uh, love the people that you want, it's complicated because then wow. I, I have to train every day five hours more or less. Yeah. And how I train alone in the mountain with my mind, uh, thinking all the time with the same, why I did this, why not, uh, why I'm suffering this, why I'm, I'm feeling these things inside me yeah. and, and, and why we have this big problem in the world. No? Yeah. And, how I can manage, how I can create new projects, how I can move the social media, how I, and all of this is, is like a bottle, no? Yeah. You have a bottle and then you start to put uh, some feelings, some bad, uh, I don't know, bad things, good things. And then one, one point, the bottle, boom, explode yeah. Yeah. and you explode and then yeah. you stop. It's a good point And it's a great, yeah, example of how our personal lives do have a big impact on our physical health, right? And when mm -hmm. when things aren't feeling good on that personal level, then it's very hard to compete and train at the level that you need to to win races at uh, the highest level. So, what was the ultimate injury in your knee? Because last time we saw each other was at UTMB last year, and I think uh, you were coming back from surgery at that point. Tell us about what that operation was. And did it have anything to do with, because I recall the last time we spoke, you had surgery when you were transitioning from being a soccer, mm -hmm. a football player to being a trail runner. Were those yeah. operations similar, those surgeries? No, when I was, when I played football in a soccer, uh, I suffered, um, I broke my ligament and the menisc, so mm -hmm. operation, and then I started run, and my knee was really good. But then I remember last days I, I told you that I was listening to you uh, the podcast with Jack Miller, mm -hmm. that he won the Andorolta Trail. So I ran the Andorolta Trail one year ago. Mm -hmm. And in the race, I feel 
a big pain on my knee. Mm -hmm. And I decided to stop in the kilometer 70 because I couldn't run in Andorra. I couldn't. And after two weeks, my knee exploded. So I was training in July of uh, 2021. I was training in, in, in my town and I felt something that it was really bad. And I, I listened bah! and, uh, and broke. Yeah. It was a cartilage in the knee. Mm -hmm. uh, the knee is like this and one cartilage is on this way. So here the cartilage explodes and it was a it broke. It yeah. was broke. So I had to go in the in the surgery and they open, they put out this cartilage and I had to be more or less uh three months doing recovery. Yeah. And I was in UTMB 2021, but it was my first my first running were there. Uh, but only 20 minutes, and after one year is now. Um, I'm ready for run the race, but yeah, the the way has been really, really long. Yeah, well, I want to hear about the rehab, but going back to our conversation at UTMB last year, mm -hmm. you said something that stuck in my head that I think is illustrative of who you are as a person, and you told me that during the mm -hmm. pandemic you had your treadmill set up in your house and you were doing <laughs> 40 to 50 K of running per day on the treadmill during yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. And of course I'm just shaking my head of just like, man, that's a serious commitment, right? Running 25 to 30 miles a day on your treadmill at home. Well, during lockdown. So I, I guess, uh, tell us what it was like to go from that level of commitment and training to then having the surgery and rehab? Like, do you pour the same level of intensity and intentionality into the rehab process? And tell us a little bit about what the rehab process entailed. So I'm really lucky because I have a good team with me because if not today, maybe I, will, I wouldn't run the, the UTMB because I, I would be injured again. Uh, and they told me, Pau, you have run a lot these years. Maybe now it's time to do a good rehab and be with more calm, maybe run less uh, in the first month, obviously. And then uh, when, you will, when you will feel good, maybe uh, we don't need to run 300 kilometers per week. Only with 200 kilometers is enough. The other hours you can use the bicycle and then you will run 10 years more. If not, yeah. maybe in two years, you will stop because your body will say, Pau, uh, you much. have done a lot, too much. Yeah. And, so, and today I, I'm training the same hours, more or less the same. Yeah. So 26 hours per week is the medium. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do more cross training. I was going to ask you about that. So let, mm -hmm. let's talk about that because just like from observing your Instagram and stuff, you've been putting up a lot of photos of you riding the bike. And it seems like you've started to emphasize that more heavily since the injury. Talk about how you use the bike in your training. So I, I train two times per day. So one time per day. No bull or, or nada, right? You always put that on your Instagram story, right? Yeah. Double or nothing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, nothing. That's, yeah. true. That's why always I'm, I'm pushing in the Instagram photos, videos, because <laughs> the people say, you don't rest. And I say, yeah, I rest, but I don't do anything more during my day. I train every day. So that's why always I'm pushing uh, with this story. So yeah. I train two times, uh, double or nothing. And in the morning, normally it's running because I feel more tired if, when I finish the, the training. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoon is, is cycling or maybe another time running. But when I do, when I ride a bicycle, I do maybe two hours, three hours. And it's only to maybe some intervals in the training but not too much it's more only to, to ride and enjoy uh, with hours and it's like we want to do volume for the ultra trails yes yep. okay but we can't do it all the volume running so we use the bicycle to do this volume yeah i think it's something that american runners are slowly learning by observing the great european champions who do such a good job of balancing other endurance sports you know ski mountaineering in the winter and a lot of cycling in the summertime so it sounds like you do mostly just 
low intensity volume on the bike, but with occasionally you'll throw some intervals in. I'm curious about that. Yeah. So in, for example, in winter, we use this, the schema, the, the ski mountaineering, and there we use more the height, high rate. Mm -hmm. So we work more in, um, yeah, with volume, but with more intervals. Mm -hmm. And, and then in, in bicycle, normally I only ride and only, yeah, only use the bicycle to, to move the legs. Yeah. And I do some races. Uh, this last weekend I did one race in, in Andorra of bicycle, but only for enjoy, yeah? No. Oh, I didn't, cool. I didn't win, yeah? no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, those, those cyclists better be scared if Pau Capel gets serious about it. But tell me about what it's been like to build your confidence back because... And this kind of maybe goes back to what you're saying about being a little bit nervous going into UTMB, but the level of the sport is accelerating and moving at a really rapid pace right now. The athletes are so good and every race you have to show up ready to perform at your best. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. there's some opportunity to use competition, smaller races to help build up towards the bigger races, Mm -hmm. But talk about how you've built your confidence back in your capabilities as an athlete and in your just trust of your own body after injury. It's really difficult eh, to, to be confident again and, and to believe in your capacities is, is so complicated. And I think that I have not the same uh, confidence uh, if I compare with 2019. Uh, I was with more confidence than today. Uh, today I'm running with uh, th this injured. I think it is not uh, recovered 100%. Really? I will have always this injury with me. Maybe here inside or maybe uh, with feelings. Eh? Uh, yep. It's depending on the day. So sometimes I think, okay, I, I have to, to learn how I can run again with this pain because some days I have this pain and then it's like, if I did one time, I can do it one more time. Mm -hmm. It's always, I think, the same. But then uh, I have some doubts, obviously. The people is running too fast. The people is training more than ever. And, and it's really difficult to win. But I, I, I have a video that I have not published yet. But I want to publish before the UTMB that I explain in Spanish uh, why the people think that we can't finish second or third. Uh -huh. The people only think that we have to win. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it, before the race, they say, but you will win. No, I will not win. Maybe one person win only. Yeah, I yeah. Don't know. I'm the winner. Maybe it's Jim Wamsley, Kylian Jornet, yeah. Hannes Nam, Pablo Villa. Pff, a lot of people will run this race. <laughs> yeah. So, how you can imagine that I can win the race? I, I will run and then we will see. And if I finish in top 10 with my time, with my planning, uh -huh. I will be really happy, uh -huh. but the people will not understand that we are happy with this. Yeah. I think this is the one thing that I want to explain to the people. Yeah. That, well, let's, uh, we, let's keep uh, going. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit more because especially for someone like you who has won the race, the expectation is that you do it again. Right. And your first UTMB, you finished sixth, So it's, you know, you've had two very good performances, but people remember the first place, right? And so there is a, a an expectation or a pressure on a returning champion, even when you have people like Killian and Jim in yeah. the field. So, so talk about talk about that a little bit more. Like, just like, is this a way of you trying to take pressure off yourself by explaining that, like, I'm here to run as well as I can. If that, if I win, amazing. But if I finish fifth or 10th or 17th, like, and I run as well as I can, I'm going to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did, I did some sessions with one psychologist, uh -huh. uh, maybe, I don't know, one month ago, because I was, I don't know, with doubts, uh, I didn't be confident with myself. Uh, I was training a lot, but I wasn't happy. Because I receive a lot of inputs of people that say, Pau, uh, oh, in UTMB, you will win again? Or you will push to Kilian? Or you will... Uh, no, no, no. Or you will break, you will do the break in 20. Say, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm human. 
So maybe in the morning I will not feel good. I will try for sure, but I, I would try to win. Obviously, I'm com- I'm really competitive. I yeah. want to win in 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 my home in all the things that we have at home. But yeah, maybe I finish ten or five or three or three. Yeah, and they have to understand because this is a negative energy for us because ah. we were a lot of in- inputs maybe are positive or maybe not that they say. Hey, Pau, come on, you can do it because you have to win. No, I don't have to win. I have to yeah. compete. And then we will see. If I enjoy, maybe I will finish in front. But if I have all the day when I'm running this, these words that you have to win, you have to win, you have to win. And in the kilometer 40, I am in the 15th position. It's really, really bad for me. Yeah, right. I, yeah, think, I love, I I love how win. you... I love how you said that it's the negative energy and it makes me mm. want to draw the parallel. Of course, I told you before we started recording here that my wife is due to give birth any minute now. And she's been saying something similar with this big endurance mm. event that's ahead for her, right? It's like, she's mm. trying to protect the energy of her birth, right? And so like when people say to her about like, oh, it's hard or it's painful or mm-hmm. whatever. She's like, I don't want to hear that. Like, I want to just experience it. I want to be in a good mental space. And it's kind of the same before mm-hmm. UTMB for you. So that's great though. And I'm glad that you're putting that video out and it is important for fans of trail running to know that, you know, the, the pressure that you guys feel at the highest level, like that's, it's a real thing. And it is possible to, to be really happy with a performance mm. that isn't a victory, even if you are Pal Capel and you have won the race in the past. So let's talk about your comeback or like your return to racing the season. Cause you've had a solid year so far. Mm-hmm. And you, you went back to trans grand Canaria to start the year, which I think you've done now mm-hmm. like six or seven times, mm-hmm. including four victories. You finished second to Pablo Villa in another great performance from you. What was it like to, to get back on the podium at a big race, like trans grand Canaria, especially after the injury and stuff? It was, for me, it was really magic because I didn't know if Pauka Pei could run again ultra distance. I didn't know. And I didn't know how my knee uh, could run again long distances. And then when I was in the race, I felt really competitive. So I was running also with Hayden Hawks, uh, with the Chinese runners that were there. I was running with Pera, with Pablo. Uh, I don't know. It was a good, a good competition there. Mm. And then, obviously, Pablo Villa was in a next level. I couldn't. After 80 kilometers, he was in a one more step than me, and mm. I felt this. And I was more smart, and I was thinking, okay, Pau, maybe you have to be calm, running your piece, and and try to yeah to focus on the podium. And I was pushing against uh, Pere Aurey and finally I, I could finish in front. And then when I finished, it was like, I, I did a big hug to Laura, is my girlfriend, mm-hmm. and my family. And I told them, maybe I can feel again a ultra trail runner. Yeah. And I can feel again professional. Because I didn't feel again before that, no? Yeah. I trained a lot, but I need it. I need to finish a race and say, okay, I finished where I have to be. Yeah. And there's such a feeling of just like relief of like, thank goodness. <laughs> like, and the yeah. same exact thing happened to me in 2020 pal at uh trans grand Canaria, where I finished third behind mm-hmm. you and Pablo via, because in 2019 I was injured all year and I was having those similar doubts that like, Oh, you're getting older. Like your ankle is a complete mess. Like these guys are so young and so fast. And (laughs) anyway, but yeah, when I finished third behind you guys, I was just like, Oh, thank goodness. Like I put another good one on the board. Like I'm not retired yet. So so then uh, let's talk about the the rest of the season before we start looking ahead towards UTMB. I know you, uh, you went and won the Patagonia hundred, one of the Spartan races down in South America, what looks like a beautiful event that you've won now twice, but then you, you sort of dropped out of Lavaredo and you've won some other sort of, uh, local races around Europe. Like you usually do, you've raced a lot this year. So maybe just catch us up on 
how uh, how those events have gone and more generally how your preparation for UTMB has gone? So in Lavaredo is a, is a pity because it's, it's a, a good race that I like it. So I, I love this place. And and then I wanted to win in Lavaredo. I, I was ready. I, mm-hmm. I did a training, but then in the mo- the Monday before the race, I I had the COVID and I tried it. I, I was during all the week doubting about if I'm professional, if I have to run or not with COVID. Uh-huh. And because maybe, I don't know if it was good for the other people, but I wanted to be separate with them. I was always alone during the week and I wanted to try. I went in the start and, and go, but then in the kilometer 60, my body say it's impossible. I couldn't run. I couldn't uh-huh. run. And, and after that, I needed to take good energy, uh, win some races. Mm-hmm. And that's why I did small races in France, in Turkey. And, and I, it was part of the, of the planning of the preparation for the UTMB. Because, you know, when we are training, I can train five hours in the mountain, but then uh, you are not in a competition. And when you are in a competition, you push a little bit more than in a training. And that's why we wanted to cross uh, volume of training and volume in competition to be faster, no? And, yeah. and now we are in, in two weeks uh, of to the race. So now we're tapering and, and try to, to be calm. To relax. <laughs> relax. Talk a little bit more about the calendar construction process for you, because you have been in your career, somebody who races quite a lot, especially if you look at the guys like Jim Walmsley, who's only done, well, I guess he did a local race in France a few weeks ago, but then he won Madeira in the spring. Think about Hannes Namberger. He's done two races this year. But of course you, you do a lot of races, you know, and some of them are shorter distance, but I just think it's interesting to see the different strategies employed by the contenders at UTMB. And so like Killian ran Sears and all this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you look at somebody like Francois Dane, who always does like three or four races the entire year. So Mm -hmm. talk about what your strategy is with calendar construction, especially building up to UTMB. Yeah. So I, I don't know how Jim Wamsley can manage the calendar with two races. I don't know. Yeah. Because it's more pressure. Because if you lost uh, in one uh, race or uh, you don't win in another race, your year is, is nothing. And, and I prefer for my security uh, be in a different races from, for example, Gran Canaria, Patagonia, and Lavaredo. These three races were main races of the year and then a big race that is UTMB. If in UTMB I can't run good, then I have three other races that I have been there yeah. doing a good job maybe or no, maybe not, no? But if I don't have these three races and I only run in UTMB and I don't do a good race, how I can explain to the sponsors, to the people that is helping me, okay, this year, nothing. Yeah. And for me, it's too much pressure. And that's why normally we have three races before UTMB. We have UTMB. And then inside this plan, we put some short races like 60 kilometers, 50, 70 to push more, to have more speed. Because yeah. if not, uh, in the trainings, I train really easy. So I have some intervals inside, but not too much. I don't like it. Yeah. So I prefer to work more in zone two, zone three maximum, zone one, obviously. And then in the races, in the short races, I work all the time in zone three, zone four. Yeah. And that's why I have different races. But these short races are not objective. So yeah, it's just training. If I'm not feeling good, I don't push. If yeah. I feel good, I push. Okay. It's not, I don't have pressure there. Yeah, it's just interesting to see just how the different athletes implement their training preparation strategy, knowing that UTMB is the goal for everybody, right? It's like the biggest yeah. goal of the season for everybody. So for those who don't remember your victory at UTMB in 2019, I mean, it was one of the most impressive races I've ever watched. Like you just went off the front from the beginning. And a lot of people, of course, were suspecting that 
eventually you would crack and somebody would catch you from behind. And Xavier also ran a fantastic race, started making up time on you, but then you found a second win and ultimately won by like 45 minutes, a very convincing victory wire to wire. And I was texting with uh, our mutual friend, Keith Byrne yesterday. And I, because he told me a, a funny story that I want you to relay here on the podcast about that race last year or in 2019 and specifically the stories about the phone calls that you made on the uh-huh. course, because I don't know if a lot of people know this and it's like <laughs> one of the coolest like sporting stories I can remember hearing, especially from trail running. Tell, uh-huh. tell the people about the the phone calls that you made during the race in 2019. So normally the, the people use the, these small phones like this <laughs> and, and you can't see anything in the in the screen yeah but i don't like it i prefer to use my iphone my normal phone is big one i have the music i have my instagram sometimes in the races i i do some videos uh filming me for the instagram then <laughs> i will not publish because the people will think this guy is crazy so i prefer to not publish but in the 2019 before the race i was thinking pow what you can do also, I had my planning eh, of timing, but what you can do during the race for the for the people that you love. And I thought, okay, maybe if I prepare one call for each marathon, the race is four marathons because 42 plus four, four marathons, uh, UTMB. So the first call I will do to my parents. The second, my girlfriend. The third, my coach. And the fourth, one friend. And these four people were the pillars of my life. Yeah. And that's why when I arrived in the kilometer 42, I was using the phone and I called my mother and my father. They were following me, but they were in the hotel because it was in the night. And I called and my mother say, Pau, what is happening? No, no, no. I'm really good. No worries. I'm really good. I'm running. Uh, but Pau, what are you doing? No, I'm running. I'm in Bonhomme. I was in Bonhomme, more or less. Yeah, yeah. They called it Bonhomme, yeah, early in the race. I feel really good. Uh, two, I don't know, the, the hour, uh, 10, 11, I don't know. Yeah. But I, I have to do this call. And she told me, what call? I say, nothing, nothing. Only things that I'm thinking. Bye-bye. And I put off. Yeah. And then in the kilometer 84 to my girlfriend, kilometer 120 to my coach, and when I was in Chamonix, before three kilometers to the finish, I called my, my friend and he told me, Pau, did you finish? I, I was following in the screen and you're running. I said, no, no, I'm running, but I have to call you. This is the last one. Yeah. I'm going to um, thank you to be my friend. And, and, yeah, and, and I put off and then I called him again uh, when I finished. Yeah. I, say, uh, I explained him a little bit what was happening. Yeah. No, but, these inputs are really positive. Oh, it's a beautiful story, man. I mean, it's amazing. Like to imagine just being the people who are receiving that call. And I can totally empathize yeah. with your mother. Who's probably like, Oh my God, he's dropped out of the race. Like, why the hell is he calling us at 10 o'clock yeah. in the evening, climbing cold to And of mm-hmm. course you were in the lead of the race that whole time. And it's just like one of those just amazing sporting stories of, yeah, like, okay, how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep your mm-hmm. mind engaged? And I'd love how you're just like articulating that it's a way for you to show your gratitude to the people who support you in your yeah. life as an athlete. It's a beautiful so, story. If, if I would not have these people with me, I don't know if I would be professional today. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really honest now, eh? because uh, I can train and I can train a lot, uh, a lot of hours, but when I'm sad or when I'm tired or when I don't want to continue, they are the people that say, Pau, we are here with you, not for you, with you. And and this is a big difference, no? Because I feel always with, with people that I love, with mm-hmm. my parents, with my sister, with my brother, with my girlfriend, with my friends. And they moved to Chamonix to encourage me to run. And this is really nice. I'm not father, but the day that I will be father yeah. and I will see my son in a, in a checkpoint and they will look me. I don't know if I will have more power or not, yeah. but I will not stop. I know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I re- I remember after you won when you were at the finish line in the corral there, and you were you know giving a big hug to your dad and just like the pride mm-hmm. that he had, and then also thinking as you're mentioning children last year when Francois won, you know, and his wife and his three kids are there, and it's just like wow, like it, none of this is possible without them. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I just, I just love that story of like you being in, in the lead at UTMB in 2019, running one of the most memorable hundred mile races that I can recall and having the energy to make phone calls to the people who are important in your life. It's a beautiful story. So, um, then, you know, obviously like, let's just touch on the breaking 20 thing for a sec, cause you mentioned it a little bit now and you've also mentioned like being a professional. And I think this is one of the things you've just done such a good job in your career of like thinking of cool things to do, like how to engage the community, how to do fun things. And of course, living through the pandemic when there weren't racing opportunities, you came up with this fun idea to run around Mont Blanc and attempt to break 20 hours. Ultimately you ran about 21 hours, but for me, it was so entertaining because you just broadcasted the whole thing on Instagram live and I watched hours of it and it clicked in my mind of just like how easy it is to do cool stuff like that, you know? And, um, I just thought it was impressive that you had that forethought, but maybe just talk about the, the breaking 20 project, how it's informed your race coming up here in a couple of weeks at UTMB. And then also Keith told me that you're going to be doing a film showing during mm-hmm. UTMB week. So tell us about all that stuff. So the the breaking the breaking twenty f- appears in a in a call with my manager, and that's I was training the first days after the pandemic, and and the race was cancelled. And I remember that I called my manager and I say I want to run because last year I won the race and I want to run again. And he told me, okay, if you want, go there and run. And I say, okay. And we start to create this breaking 20, no? Because when I finish, sorry for what I'm going to say, but when I finish the race in 2019, in a dinner after the race, I told to my manager, Jordi, I think that I can run faster because during the race, I didn't run in my 100%. Yeah, And I think that we can run in less than 20 hours. And that's why we create the Breaking 20. That's why I went in Kenya to train with the Kenyan athletes, to train with Eliud Kipchoge, to be faster, because yeah. I have to be faster. Uh, and that's why we, we say Breaking 20, because Eliud did the Breaking 2, the Breaking 2 hours. And I explained this project to Eliud, and I said, to him, Eliud, I want to use this breaking, the name. And because if if you don't say, uh, Pau, you can use, I will not use it. Yeah, You have to say that I can use Out it. Out of respect because he did the breaking two project, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, And he told me, okay, Pau, you can use it because I know that you are you're normal, you're healthy, blah, blah, blah. So you can, you can use it. And, and that's why we did the breaking 20. But... When the people ask me, Pau, you will do the Breaking 20 this year, I say, no. I'm sorry if North Face wants. I'm sorry if the yeah. people think, but I can't say that I'm going to do the Breaking 20. Because yeah. if I start the race with this, with this mind about we are going to crash the 20 hours, I will not finish. It's impossible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have to be normal and think normal and think about it's impossible to do in breaking 20, but if the race is good and I feel good, maybe in the last 20 kilometers, we can try it. <laughs> uh, if we are close, if not, I'm not, I'm sure that it's really complicated, but it's my dream. Yeah. And I have, I had a dream when I started run. It was win the UTMB uh-huh. and I did. And yeah. now I have one dream is try to do the breaking 20. What's the problem? That maybe Jim Wamsley or Kilian, they can <laughs> <laughs> this is my problem. But yeah. 
I'm human. I'm sorry. Sure, sure. I love it, man. Keep the dream alive until you achieve it. I mean, it's one of the reasons why you are a UTMB champion. So tell us about the the film, because Keith said that you're mm-hmm. going to be doing a little film showing during UTMB week. And there, I'm sure there's going to be some listeners who are going to want to attend in person, but also maybe tell us when we might be able to see it on the internet. Yeah, this film is uh, more or less how Pau Capay can run in UTMB for the breaking 20. Mm -hmm. So how I can prepare my body to do it. And we explain a little bit uh, about Kenya. Uh, When I went in Kenya, I I went with a production of people. So we filmed there. And then they film also in in my home in Andorra. So uh, we show how I'm training in Andorra. And I show also a little bit about my family, my friends, and how is the people that is around me and is helping me. Mm-hmm. So it's more a little bit how I can prepare uh, my body. But we talk more, not training, more about how we are. Uh, we are humans. We are yeah. not robots. Uh-huh. So like humans, how we can prepare. And this is more or less, it's only 30, 40 minutes. It's not too long, mm-hmm. but it's really nice, nice film. Also yeah. some athletes. Uh, uh, talk there. So Rory Bosio, for example. Oh, great. Uh, is part of this film. Great. And so will it be at the North Face store in Chamonix? Yeah, uh, we'll be in the North Face store. I think it's Wednesday, I think, cool. if I'm not drunk, or Thursday. I don't know. Cool. I'm sure you'll post about it on your Instagram. So yeah, for yeah. those who are in, in Chamonix, just make sure you check in on Pau's uh, Instagram story yeah. during race week, and then hopefully we'll be able to see it on the on the internet shortly thereafter. So let's talk about the race now because it's mm-hmm. only two weeks away. I'm curious yeah. where your head's at. I mean, you said that you're not as confident going into the race this year as you were in 2019. Is that born of maybe just the injury that you've been through since then? Or is it maybe the mm-hmm. training hasn't come as naturally? Like, well, why aren't you as confident as you are in 2019? So in 2019, I did the best race of my life and it's complicated to do the same. Yeah. I'm really honest, it's really complicated. In 2019, I did the times that I wanted and I follow my times. This time, in this year, I will do the same, more or less the same times, more or less the same times. Mm-hmm. I have two options depending if I'm feeling good or if not. So, mm-hmm. uh, but then the training is done. So I have, I have done a good volume of training more or less the same i try it to copy the same year with the same races more or less the same training the same coach because i'm training again with laia she was my coach in 19 then we stop because i needed to stop with her and after the injury i start again with her and i'm feeling good again so uh, i think all the things are in a good way and then during the race uh, is try to focus only on my time. I have also one surprise for the race, uh, not calls, but one surprise uh, for more people. So well, we, I will do something oh, also okay. to disturb my mind. Eh? It's not, oh. it's like I'm running and maybe I do some things to take positive energy, but these yeah. things for people also, no? So uh, yeah, um, I'm ready for the race. And then, I don't know, if Jim and Killian run faster, uh, we have to do this. Congratulations and go home happy. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's really easy. So let's talk about that, like the strategy element, because like I mentioned in 2019, you were off the front through Les Zouches, you know, eight kilometers <laughs> into the race. And you had like a 20 minute lead going over the Col de Benome, which is about 50K into the race. So it was apparent that you were racing with your trademark, just confident and aggressive strategy. Yeah. And this year, I mean, obviously like the likes of Killian and Jim, like they're not going to let you go and you're not going to be able to run away from them. I think that early. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I'm wondering what, what you're thinking about strategically. So I think it's impossible to run alone this year because they will not want. And the strategy is follow my times. I did in 2019, I followed my times. I didn't want to arrive first in Saint-Gervais and I didn't want to arrive first in Col de Bonhomme or uh, Grand Col Ferret. 
I didn't want. It's only I wanted to arrive there with my times. And this year is is the same. I know that if I want to play or yeah, to play with them in, in the war that they will play, I I can't win. It's impossible. They are better. So I have to play my war. And wow. My, my war is my war. It's only me. Yeah. Only my and then maybe it's like, I don't know in English, but it's like this small animal that is doing small things, small things, and then finally he has a castle. Yeah. And then yeah. you can have a big guy that try to do a big castle in one day and the castle will will go down. Yeah. So prefer to be this small animal, oh, yeah, do no my more. job in silence, blah, 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 blah and finally arrive in Chamonix in 20 hours. Yeah. So expand on that a little bit, because I think that's kind of an interesting thing for you to say that like, if you play Killian and Jim's game Mm. that you won't win because in your interpretation is that they're better than you. I think that's debatable. I mean, you're absolutely in their category as an athlete, but tell us more about what you mean by that. Because I'm normal, uh, Dylan, I don't know. So I train a lot of hours, but I'm not special. I'm yeah. not the faster in the race. I'm not the best athlete in the downhills. And I'm not the best athlete in the fast place or in the uphills. I'm not the best. I'm the best in my life. Yeah. My life is only my life mm-hmm. with my family, with my times, with my feelings. And I know that if I play this game, I can be the best yeah. because I'm not alone. I have a team with me and it's not the same. If you want to fight one by one, it's only one by one. But if I am with 10 people, one against 10 people, we will win. And that's why I want to think about that yeah. because I'm not special. I'm not an athlete. I'm normal. And, yeah. and I have to know. And if I want to... Uh, run against Killian. For me, Killian is like a robot. He's not human. <laughs> He's not normal. It's impossible that one normal athlete, sorry for Jim, but Jim Wamsley tried to win Hard Rock, tried to win Certinal, Cegama, and UTMB in the same year. Certinal, Killian has not won yeah. uh, this morning, but for three minutes. But then the other races, he has won. Yeah. This race. He, he won Hard Rock and he will try to win and he can win UTMB. Uh, I can't win Cegama. It's impossible. Yeah. So we have to know that. And then with your, uh, I don't know, with your, uh, in English, with your things, uh-huh. do the best. Yeah. So if you think that you are good eating, do your best work eating. Yeah. Uh, don't lose uh, your water your food, be in control of that. If you are good walking, do your best walking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not important if they run. Okay, if they run in this uphill to Gran Colferret, congratulations for them. Yeah. If I can't, walk, but walk good. Not only do walking, no, walk yeah. good. And if you plus all of this, finally, you have a good result. And that's why I won UTMB, eh? not I for other I love it. Yeah. It is about just like paying attention to your own mm-hmm. race and doing all those, those little things the best that you can. So let's start winding down now, but it's makes me want to ask, as we talk about Killian a little bit, you and Killian are two of, I think probably the only two Spaniards who've ever won UTMB. Mm-hmm. And, and also this year, Pablo Villa is in the race and the three of you guys represented really interesting Spanish element in the field. Is that something that you think about at all? The national pride and, and maybe because of course, like, especially in the last, like, I think it's 13 years or something like that. Uh, the Frenchmen have just dominated except for you and Killian, but now Killian is back. You're back. And Pablo Villa has had an amazing season. Yeah. He's a great athlete. And he's won, yeah. he's won TDS. Um, so maybe uh, talk about that a little bit, the Spanish pride. Maybe we should 
do a, a meeting together before yeah. the wedding. <laughs> We, we, we should do a team. I don't know. Uh, I will propose them. But yeah. also Luis Alberto is running new team B this year. Oh, Luis Alberto is running. That's right. So one of the, the all-time best. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's the second time for him in mm-hmm. the ultra distance with the UTMB. But, but yeah, obviously they are, they are, for me, in the top five for sure. They will yeah. be there. And But no, we have not talked about uh, do some... A strategy together we yeah. should do it but but yeah maybe i will prepare a whatsapp group and <laughs> i will i will tell them that maybe we have to do it to to win the french people or the american yeah yeah well very cool no, in, the, in the american you do it normally or not or no no i mean I, i'm i'm sure there's there's some conversation back and forth but i mean there there isn't that team element on a national level i think sometimes the sponsors you know you may see a little yeah. bit of team encouragement but um yeah i don't know i think utmb is an interesting race because it's the race in which there is the most national diversity and where the best athletes from every country are present right and yeah. and of course the americans like on the men's side have had a hard time, you know, racing to our potential. And I don't know, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to like, when I look at the, the, uh, fields that are assembling for all the different races at UTMB, I'm always also looking at the nationalities of the top mm-hmm. athletes and thinking about, yeah. you know, the, the density. And, you know, I think in recent history, the French have just been so good. And, um, yeah. and then, you know, you and Killeen have been, the Spaniards, but now that we're seeing the rise of the Chinese and Asian athletes, which I think is going to be a very interesting thing too. So anyway, it's just an exciting time in the sport. And, uh, I just love how it's so global and international Mm -hmm. now, and there's so many good athletes from every corner of the earth. So, so pal, maybe, uh, in closing, let's just talk about the team that you've put together. Cause you've been talking about it our entire conversation of just like the importance of the personal life, the importance of your friends and family to be around you. How do you approach the team element during UTMB? Of course, you're only allowed to have one crew member, but tell us about the people that you have in your corner and uh, how they've helped you to be the athlete that you are today. The people you, you mean, for example, North Face. Yeah, nor, like your sponsors or your family, and and then also just like who takes care of you during the race, you know, okay. like your crew. So in in my crew is my family. Obviously, is my uh, normally in, in the Hotel du Mont Blanc. I rent a house, so for them and for me, uh, North Face, for example, they uh, offered me to be in the same house with the other athletes, but. I'm very grateful, but I prefer to be with my family. Yeah. And I rent a house for them, my family, my parents, girlfriend, uh, my brother, my sister. And, and yeah, and we are uh, with some friends, maybe we're 10 in the house. And and then my coach, also my, my physio is there. Uh, and yeah, this is my crew. And then obviously, uh, for example, North Face, uh, for the race, they want to help me uh, during the race, in the checkpoints, in the in the refreshments, but I have my crew, and for me it's enough. Otherwise, who does that for the, you? Is it your girlfriend yeah. that crews for you, or yeah, 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 okay. yeah it's my girlfriend. She she will manage all the all the uh, all the points, the checkpoints, and then during the night uh, she's with my mother, and my father is resting, and then my father in the morning will come because my father is older than my mother. So my <laughs> father is 70, 71 years old. So imagine that 71 be in, in Courmayer. Yeah, you don't need to go to Courmayer, Pops. You know, you just yeah. stay <laughs> home and <laughs> sleep through it. It's not, not necessary. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's why he comes normally in Champeclac, La Folie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, comes there and my mother, yeah, with my, with my girlfriend, with Laura, yeah. they will be you know, all the points following me and maybe my sister, my brother. Yeah. So for me, it's better if obviously I love the people in North Face. And, yeah. and when I'm tired, I want to listen. The people in North Face say, oh, you can do it. Come on. But they are friends, maybe. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, they, they, they help you in other ways, right. You know, they give you, they give you the opportunity to be a professional athlete, but I don't know. I just think it's just, again, remembering back to when you won the race and your family being there and then Francois Mm -hmm. last year, and then also like Courtney DeWalter and her husband, Kevin, like his, him crewing her and watching that on the live stream. And I don't know, you've just mentioned so many times, just like your friends and family and how important they are and thinking about the phone calls you made in 2019. I don't know. It's a beautiful thing and a special part of the sport when we can include those who are most important to us in these life-changing journeys around these mountains. Well, pal, dude, it's so fun to catch up, man. I'm so glad to see you back from injury. I know firsthand how hard it is to go through that shit. And uh, it's just good to see you back in top form again. And getting ready to, to line up at the world's most important race at UTMB. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Dylan. And I hope to listen to your voice again uh, when I will watch the, the last kilometers in the UTMB that I do a lot of times when I'm training in the trade mile and I put the video of the last kilometers of the UTMB and you are, you are talking <laughs> with Keith uh, in the finish line. So I listen a lot of times. So I hope this year repeat and I hope to listen to you again. Well, good luck, man. Thanks so much.